Hey everyone, Merry Christmas. <gasps> Did you hear that? I thought it might be the left coming to arrest me for saying Merry Christmas. I've heard they're doing that now. I don't know who they are, but I know they hate Christmas. This is the second entry in my series specifically talking about the right wing and why paying any attention to their arguments is a waste of time. But I still don't feel quite comfortable using terms like left and right without qualifying them at the start. They can be quite useful words, but they're much less useful than when most people use them. What unifies the left? What brings together anarchists, Leninists, and social democrats? That's what I mean when I say leftists, so I only use the term because I'm limited by imprecise language. Or are they not the left? Is the left something else, something more or less than that? Lumping these different groups together is a bit like putting cats and pigeons in the same cage and telling them their liberation is bound up together so they have to work it out. Liberals aren't really leftists, but in US politics, they're a little confused about words, so liberals get called the left too. To hear some people talk, people who might say they were on the right, you would think everyone who disagrees with them is a radical leftist. So when using these terms, please bear in mind, I think the whole left-right thing is misleading at best. I'm talking about beliefs. People who call themselves conservatives share beliefs with people who proudly call themselves white nationalists. So unlike the so-called left, the right can be said to exist because it has things in common. Their beliefs make them easy targets for others on the right to manipulate, so they're dangerous. Let's talk about how the right's ignorance and twisting of words ruins every conversation. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. This video is sponsored by an awesome new way to listen to your devices, Raekwon earbuds. Now you can listen to It Had To Be Said anywhere, and you only have to listen to a little Wu-Tang every time you turn them on. What was I saying? Oh yeah, here's how the right ruins every conversation. Someone makes something up, knowing hardly anyone else on the right will look it up, and soon enough it becomes a widely believed fact. A headline says Muslim immigrants want to cancel Christmas because they're offended by it, so millions of people share the headline without looking into the story and finding out there's no truth to it. Millions of people let their prejudices against Muslims increase because they read and shared a lie. Revealing the truth might change a few minds, but the damage has been done. Or if you're into the really far-right media, it might be the Jews who are canceling Christmas in a given year. There are already countless stories like this out there, along with much worse, and unless you know they're all false, you might think this story fits the pattern. The real pattern is right-wing lies. It happens every day. Someone on the right will distort or invent a story that casts its enemies in an ugly light and it gets shared so many times, the right unquestioningly accepts it as their latest article of faith. A similar tactic is when they take an existing idea or word that originated to improve things, make up a new meaning, and get everyone on the right to attack it. No one learns what it really means, because they've been told by an expert on Fox News or PragerU, so they assume it's correct. And of course, as they understand it, the issue is super serious and needs to be resolved with force if necessary. But not everything you hear on TV is based on fact. The upshot is, when some people want to have a serious conversation about serious issues, right-wingers come in with their superficial understanding and lead the conversation around in circles as people who know what they're talking about patiently explain they're wrong about everything. 
Ignorant people ruin conversations when they barge in and demand their right to speak. They need to learn to acknowledge their ignorance and listen. It took me a long time to do that, so I understand, but that doesn't excuse it. Right-wingers insist on remaining both ignorant and vocal. I'd like to be clear, it's not just right-wingers who trick and get tricked by manipulating language. Liberal progressive types and even leftists do it too. What was once liberation by any means necessary has moved on to human rights, if you don't mind. What was once abolish the police quickly became, well, we didn't mean abolish. <laughs> we did, actually. Don't water down revolutionary slogans. You're not helping. And to say liberals or leftists don't lie or share things on social media without reading them would be patently false. But the right does something else entirely. It twists and distorts words until they're a shadow of their former selves, all the meaning squeezed out and replaced with vague associations of good or bad. Those things coded good become the backbone of our society or country or whatever, while the bad things can always be invoked as the enemy of our society, the evil we must try to eradicate. Their country is good, for reasons they learned in elementary school, so anyone that uses the word unpatriotic must be talking about something bad. They love everything about their countries and cultures, except the people they hate and the things they hate and the things they want everyone to forget. The right opposes any change to the status quo that doesn't give its people more power. Usually, that would make them reactionaries. But nowadays, many on the right paint themselves as the opposite, as rebels. If you tell everyone the left is in power, and it's taking away your freedom, millions of people who've decided the so-called left is their enemy will choose to believe it. If this radical left is really in power and cracking down on the right, people who oppose it are brave dissenters and independent thinkers. They're the heroes cleansing this otherwise perfect country or civilization of its evildoers. But the left isn't in power. If it were, there would be no homelessness or student debt, to say the least. Really, the only thing the right is rebelling against is its own imagination. Let's dive into their latest enemy in the war on knowledge, critical race theory, or CRT. It's the newest thing for right-wingers to rail against without having read a word of it. If you really don't know what it is, take a minute to Google it, or check the link in the description. But some people are too busy sharing angry Facebook posts to use Google. They'll tell you your kids are being taught CRT, which they are not, that it teaches white kids to hate themselves, which it doesn't, and believe all white people are inherently bigots, as if academics would ever say something so simplistic. There is some legitimate criticism of CRT, but that's not it. The same people who say there isn't enough freedom of speech on college campuses insist on banning everything they label CRT, because for them, freedom is just another word to use to hit people on the head with. Before I go into examples of how CRT typifies the right-wing response to things, I want to try, probably in vain, to clear up one of the countless misconceptions popular on the right. No one is saying all white people are to blame for all their problems. That's one of those talking points when you hear, you know the person saying it forms their opinions on people without actually listening to those people. What we're saying is white people benefit disproportionately from a system that takes from people just because of their race and gender and gives to people like me who conform to the, the default, supposed default identities of the culture, like being white, 
being a man, being cisgender and heterosexual, being able-bodied and neurotypical. The farther you are from those arbitrary cultural standards, the less access you have to opportunities because they're given to people like me, and the more chance you will be the victim of violence. That's how these systems work, in a nutshell. The problem is, we internalize propaganda beliefs like the system is fair and doesn't discriminate, everyone has the same opportunities, etc. What's more, we inherit prejudices from the culture around us, which even the people being stereotyped might believe about themselves. If you watch a lot of media with black and Latino gangbangers living in poor neighborhoods and shooting each other, like the news, it's going to affect how you see black and Latino people. Not enough media prompt us to ask why. Why is there still poverty in a world of such abundance? Why are poverty and crime always associated with black, brown, and indigenous people? Why do they go to pr prison so disproportionately to other groups? If I don't ask why, or if I'm satisfied with the easy answers the propaganda gives me, I can ignore the violence and oppression around me as causes of social problems and go back to pretending everyone just gets what they deserve. They're comfortable beliefs. They're drilled into us every day of our lives, so they're unconscious, too. Which is how you can be racist without meaning to. If you haven't considered how you're affected by propaganda, you won't notice unconscious racist tendencies and biases, and you might deny they exist. You don't have to accept propaganda on its face. You can challenge it. But some people would rather spread it around. CRT has been called a hateful fraud and a cult of indoctrination. They're really rallying all the evil-sounding words to scare people. It's the new intolerance. See how they twist these words around? We're not intolerant, you're intolerant. And the rejection of the underpinnings of Western civilization, which means nothing. What do all these attacks add up to? The exact targets of CRT's critics vary wildly, but it's obvious that most critics simply do not know what they're talking about. Instead, CRT functions for the right today primarily as an empty signifier for any talk of race and racism at all, a catch-all specter lumping together multiculturalism, wokeism, anti-racism, and identity politics, or indeed any suggestion that racial inequities in the United States are anything but fair outcomes, the result of choices made by equally positioned individuals in a free society. They're simply against any talk, discussion, mention, analysis, or intimation of race, except to say we shouldn't talk about it. That sentence should probably read, to legislate that we shouldn't talk about it. See, they could engage with it by, like, doing the reading, but they won't, because they treat it with the same willful ignorance and contempt they treat anything that requires reading. The only reason I can see that you would want to hear these right-wingers talk about anything is if you wanted reassurance that your ignorance and lack of compassion were justified. Prangaroo made a video on the topic where they said this nonsense. Critical race theory holds that the most important thing about you is your race. The color of your skin, that's who you are. Not your behavior, not your values, not your environment. Your race. They're actually claiming that serious academics write books and papers where they say something so simplistic and obviously wrong. Of course, they do no such thing, and you would only need to read one page of their writing to know that. But the video has 2 million views and 37k likes, so that's at least 37,000 people shutting down every argument that could possibly be considered critical race theory by saying you think race is the only thing that matters in life and you just blame white people for everything. The video continues in this vein, more arguments they pull out of their asses because of course they never cite any sources from all the literature available free online, 
and that's presumably because they've never read any, but also because it would prove them wrong. So, of course, the anti-CRTists struggle to give examples of critical race theorists. The funniest thing to me is when, as an example, they bring up Robin D'Angelo. Robin D'Angelo's work is not critical race theory. If your bet noir is Robin D'Angelo and you've never even heard of Derek Bell or Kimberlé Williams Crenshaw, you probably don't know anything about CRT. Why would you be so confident in your understanding of something you haven't even Googled that you're willing to support laws banning it? The Pragerus can paint themselves and people who agree as truth-telling heroes fighting against this sinister leftist influence that's corrupting your children, rather than people yelling at a cartoon they drew. Now, thanks to all this right-wing noise, state governments are banning the teaching of what they call critical race theory. Don't worry, none of the laws say anything about Professor Crenshaw or intersectionality. They say things like, no teaching that white kids are responsible for slavery. Well, has anybody been teaching that? I never see any actual examples of the horror stories they tell, presumably because there aren't any. But Idaho House Bill 377 states, Teachers aren't allowed to compel students to affirm that individuals by virtue of sex, race, ethnicity, religion, color, or national origin are inherently responsible for actions committed in the past by other members of the same sex, race, ethnicity, religion, color, or national origin. Which teacher's been doing that? None, of course. And it has nothing to do with critical race theory, even though the legislation says that's what CRT is. More recently, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has introduced a bill to allow parents to sue anyone who tries to teach their kids CRT, which is not even defined. So it's a bit like saying you can sue teachers for teaching. The bill is even called the Stop Woke Act. It might as well be called Red Scare Part 3. I expect what a ban would mean in practice is the government giving itself the power to decide which books and authors are no longer allowed to be taught anywhere in the state, and which teachers are just a little too anti-racist to continue teaching. The freedom people are fine with government having all the power it wants, as long as the violence preserves the status quo. Critical race theory is about questioning the dominant assumptions about race. Critical race theorists look at institutions and systems, not just the individual like we're trained to. But it's a whole field of study. People who say, like, Critical race theory states such and such are misleading you. Who states that? What precisely do they state? If you don't know that, what precisely are you against? Well, learning about the history of racism is threatening. It might mean examining our assumptions about race and how institutions reinforce white supremacy. It might be revealed how white people benefit disproportionately from the system, and how the system conditions us not to notice. We might no longer be entitled to more for no good reason. Some people will defend their privileged positions to the death. Of course, they're afraid of critical race theory. They don't want anyone learning to think critically about race. But unless you're in law school, you probably never read any CRT. You could just read So You Want to Talk About Race by Ijoma Oluo. But the right doesn't care about facts or substance or books. It cares about words and the emotions they evoke. CRT has never been accurately explained to the right, and now they've all heard of it, they don't need to explain what's bad about it anymore. 
Just say CRT in a headline and conservatives will read it to get outraged. And on Halloween, or so they say, you can say critical race theory three times in the mirror and the ghost of Derrick Bell will appear and try to teach you about racism and constitutional law. But I've never tried it. But you can see how they can't really say what they actually mean when they talk about CRT. No one's saying out loud they like white supremacy or want to continue to benefit from it. They say they're opposed to this new woke ideology indoctrinating your children into a cult. That way, they're attacking an idea they made up, along with anyone they say is associated with it, instead of having to defend what they actually believe. They change the conversation from why they're wrong to why their enemies are evil. Judging from their actions, right-wingers want to keep children completely in the dark about history and racism, and thereby create a new generation of white supremacists. But if they said that, they would have to defend it. Instead, they're introducing legislation to combat insidious leftist influence on schools, like uh, history class. Of course, they'll say they want to teach accurate history, but if that were true, surely what you'd be able to sue teachers or, or schools for would be lies. But no, they're allowed to tell the students blatant lies, as long as they don't imply white people were the main beneficiaries of slavery, even though they were, or that black people were the main group of people enslaved, even though they were. But CRT is just the latest catastrophic outrage that requires an aggressive response. In the past 10 years, we've heard the right appropriate the terms woke, trigger, identify as, cancel culture, political correctness, antifa, toxic masculinity, and any left-sounding political term like Marxism. They take words that have meanings, make up a bunch of shit about them, get everyone to associate them with a radical fringe that doesn't have to be taken seriously, and then move on to the next thing they don't know anything about. Like, remember when every conservative woman was going out of her way to tell everyone, masculinity isn't toxic, when the term toxic masculinity came out? I can't tell if they deliberately corrupted the term as soon as they heard it, or just never bothered to listen to the people using it, but the effect is the same. Everyone who should have been listening to what aspects of modern masculinity could be considered toxic just made jokes about it, so they didn't have to listen. Patriarchy. Pfft. Feminism. Pfft. Feminists just hate men. No. No, no they don't. Not every woman online who says they hate all men represents feminism. No, no. If, if you really wanted to dismiss their arguments anyway, because they felt threatening to you, you could just say, Oh, I understand feminism. Feminists blame men for everything. Oh, you're a feminist? You must hate men. Oh, you're a socialist? Don't you know socialism killed a hundred million people just by socializing them? You must not have anything to say. So right-wingers don't listen, so they don't know what words mean, so you get them asking if you're triggered because they made a joke that wasn't funny. They don't care that trigger warnings are for people with trauma, like survivors with PTSD. It's somehow associated with the left, presumably because it means being sensitive to people instead of unnecessarily being an asshole, so they have to ridicule it. They'll say, I'm a man, but I identify as an attack helicopter. <laughs> because they want to tell you they only know one joke that gets passed around conservative circles, and they want to know that they don't know what words mean. Because if you identify as something, you are that thing. If you identify as a man, you're a man. That's it. 
But because learning about gender is new, it's scary. So they have to reject it out of hand and remind you of their one clever joke. They're not interested in the science. They're not interested in meeting trans people. No bully wants to humanize their victims. Speaking of not knowing what words mean, have you ever heard people like Jordan Peterson talk about postmodern neo-Marxists? What do you think it means? Who does it refer to? Because I have no idea. I've never in all my time talking to leftists heard one of them call themselves a neo-Marxist or refer to neo-Marxism. And Marxism, by the way, is a materialist philosophy as opposed to a postmodern one. So postmodern neo-Marxists is a contradiction in terms and means nothing. But it's a great gateway phrase to cultural Marxism. Mm. If you hear anyone angrily referring to cultural Marxism, you know they're being manipulated by Nazis. Because the term cultural Marxism derives from the term cultural Bolshevism, which came from the Nazis. And their neo-variety is who uses it most today. It has always been used to refer obliquely to Jews and their supposed control of everything and desire to bring down Western civilization. And the thing about the right is a Nazi can get conservatives to say things like cultural Marxism and globalists, which is also an anti-Semitic dog whistle, by the way, just by making posts in online conservative forums or slipping it into a Donald Trump speech. After all, we've been brought up to believe in our country and the merits of Western civilization. It only takes a couple of TED Talks to make people think the West is the fount of all the world's wisdom. We have all these mainstream quasi-intellectuals with low-grade political takes like Jordan Peterson and Richard Dawkins and Steven Pinker always talking about Western civilization and the evils of socialism like the conservative boomers they are. And millions of people think there really is a West that has created everything good in the world and a Marxist plot to bring it down. I haven't tried to calculate what percentage of people who say Western civilization and feel proud just mean white people, but it doesn't matter. The term the West has always connoted white people, just like American and Canadian do. So you should defend the West, as we define it, pretty much just white people, against what we say are its enemies, like cultural Marxism and globalists. If that means spending all day arguing on the internet over terms you don't understand, so be it. How do you have a conversation with someone who doesn't know what the words they use mean, but insists they're right? I can't debate about these topics with a right-winger because I would spend my allotted time telling them they're using the words wrong, that they've clearly never listened to the people affected except to tokenize them, and they're substituting strongly held opinion for facts. I would want to sit them down in an informal setting and challenge them to think about what their beliefs are, where they come from, why they think that way, and if it actually brings them any benefit. On an individual level, many people can be reasoned with. But as a group, the right is committed not only to ignoring people who want to make things better, but demonizing them and their ideas. See, while radicals want to eliminate harmful ideologies like white supremacy, the right sees an attack on white supremacy as an attack on itself. And they're right, by the way. So attacking anti-racism becomes their priority. So you can find no end of videos and articles about why being woke and political correctness and whatever other things they've made up or co-opted are bad. 
but they never really address people's arguments because they're actually pretty reasonable. Argument. Racism hurts people, so no one should be racist. Right-wing response. You leftists call everyone racist. The leftists can try to reply and say, no, that's not it, but already the the right-winger has derailed the conversation, and we're no longer talking about racism. We're talking about cancel culture, or whatever other nonsense they're on about this week. Because if we have an honest uh, conversation about racism, we might have to do something about it. Whereas if we talk about cancel culture, we have a whole new group of victims to pretend to care about, and we can ignore the real ones. That's why it shouldn't surprise anyone that these folks spend so much time making stuff up about anti-fascists and anti-racists. They'll talk about Antifa members. It's not an organization, Fox News pundit. There are no members. Antifa means anti-fascism. That's it. If they're not engaged in anti-fascist organizing, it's incorrect to call them that. But the right wants simple targets, so it makes up all kinds of things about how anti-fascism is always violent and how everything that goes down is because of anti-fascists, or more commonly, Antifa and BLM. What they've done is turn what should be the default position, opposing racism and white supremacy and the institutions that support them, into a radical position that people don't feel comfortable associating with. And they do that with everything. I think we should be really suspicious about people who rail against anti-fascists. Why are they so interested in trashing them? Is it because they're a threat to right-wing organizing? Likewise, the simple phrase, Black Lives Matter. It's so hard for people on the right to bring themselves to say that black people's lives might matter that they won't say it. They just say, BLM and pretend all protests anywhere in favor of black lives come from this sinister organization called BLM. They can't imagine, or at least can't admit publicly, that there are plenty of reasons black people and their allies would protest and even riot and loot. They've forgotten the history of the white riots and looting that took place on the land they live on that established the current order. Being so forgetful, dismissive, and incurious makes it easy for them to assign blame, as in a phrase like BLM riots, which can be used to paint an entire movement with the same brush. And if you can discredit an entire movement in someone's eyes, they think they don't have to listen to the movement and its arguments. They're just troublemakers. But even before right wingers were blaming the shadowy BLM for everything, when people started saying Black Lives Matter, there was an outcry from white people. They put all these words in their mouths like, oh, so other people's lives don't matter? You're saying Black Lives Matter more than my life? What about black on black crime? It's just a way of telling them to shut up. You only need to listen briefly to know people's answers to these questions. but. They don't even listen briefly. They don't listen to the people in the streets. They get their understanding of the situation from the likes of Tucker Carlson and Ben Shapiro, who are absolutely unqualified to have opinions on this topic. Why are they so afraid of black people speaking the truth about the United States? I think most people don't get that being comfortable and removed from all the violence in society living in a, a nice life in the suburbs or the penthouse makes us really susceptible to propaganda. It's so easy to look down on people who commit crimes or live in the streets or get addicted to drugs when you're observing it through the TV and the internet. It's easy to think the way TV tells you to. Those people are just lazy or violent or mentally ill. They blame all white people or all rich people for their troubles. No, nobody does. Nobody says that. You just don't listen to them. You listen to the news. The news tells you about topics you've never studied, so you don't know how to think critically about the reporting. 
You get your opinions from the media, but you think you're thinking for yourself, so you arrived at your opinions by yourself, objectively, without help, even though, coincidentally, everyone else who watches the news happens to think the same. What I really want to ask the right is, why are these things the problems? Why are we forced to address issues like cancel culture before we address ones like poverty, war, prisons, health, and the environment? Why is it more important to be able to sue teachers for teaching things they weren't teaching than it is to help people? Why is it so easy to mobilize people to protest things like CRT and impossible to give homeless people homes, or let people out of cages? or stop bombing people overseas. It seems to me someone has an interest in keeping as many people as possible squabbling about things that don't matter. People who use this system to get rich and wield power want to keep us divided. The more folks listen to their propaganda, the more divided we'll be. I think we should focus on the things that cause suffering and ruin people's lives and stop them, solve the, the, that as a problem. The right draws cartoons of problems and insists the cartoon is what everyone should be fighting, if they're not a traitor. Well, I am a traitor, and I don't care about their cartoons, and I'm done paying attention to their nonsense. That said, I do have a few videos left in this series, so watch this space. Before I go, I'll leave you with a few of the titles of videos I just couldn't find time to make this week.